I'm going to tell you the basics of the four forces of flight and how they make aviation possible. For all aircraft, there are always four forces acting on them. Lift, thrust, weight, and drag. Lift is the force that enables flight and pushes the aircraft into the air. Weight is the force that is always opposing lift and always acts on the aircraft. The same as our weight always acts on us. In order to achieve lift, you must have airflow over the wings. In order to achieve this, you must have a force known as thrust. But as we accelerate through the air, the air pushes back in the opposite direction of thrust. This is known as drag. I'm gonna break down each of these four forces, how they affect one another, and more importantly, how they enable flight. In my last video, I explained the Bernoulli principle. I explained how essential that principle is to enabling an aircraft to achieve flight. If you wanna learn more about that principle, go ahead and click the link right here. So as I discussed in that video, it's the shape of the wings or the airfoil that actually enables flight. I talked about how the top part of the airfoil needs to be curved in order to increase the velocity of the flow, thus decreasing the pressure on the top surface of the wing. This is essentially how lift is generated. There are several different ways in which you can increase the generation of lift for an aircraft. The first and most obvious way is to increase velocity or increase thrust. The next way to increase the lift force on an aircraft I'm sure you've seen before, but you may not have recognized the reason behind it. As an aircraft approaches the runway for landing, you'll notice that the airplane starts to tilt backwards. This is known as a flare. The reason that the aircraft does this is to increase its lift generation. Now you may ask yourself, why do we need to increase the lift force when we're trying to land the plane? And the reason is simple. There's only so much runway, so you wanna make sure that you put down the airplane and slow down to a safe speed before the end of the runway. This flare enables the aircraft to fly slower than normal in order to approach the runway at a safe speed. In aviation, the angle at which the airplane is flying is known as the angle of attack. As you increase the angle of attack, you increase the amount of lift force you generate. The reason behind this is because you're increasing the curvature on the top surface of the wing and thus increasing the velocity over the wing and decreasing the pressure. Thus, you generate more lift in the upward direction. But there is a limit to how much you can increase your angle of attack. If you increase the angle of attack too much, you may go into what's known as a stall. A stall occurs when there's not enough airflow over the top of the wing to keep the airplane airborne. When this happens, a phenomenon called flow separation occurs. This causes the air on the top of the wing to become turbulent, and it's at this point where the aircraft enters a stall. In order to recover from a stall, you need to increase your velocity. To do that, you need to decrease your angle of attack or fly downward. Doing this will allow the aircraft to generate lift again. Thrust can be generated in a variety of different ways, but for this video I'm not going to talk about the specific ways that thrust is generated, rather I'm going to talk about how thrust affects other forces of flight and the role that thrust plays in enabling flight. As I stated earlier, you need consistent thrust to enable steady level flight. In fact, thrust is so powerful that in my first day of college aerodynamics, my professor exclaimed to us that anything can fly with thrust. See? It flew! Bingo! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Oh. Except he threw his computer battery across the room. It's easy to see the truth of this when we look at things like rockets and missiles, most of which have no wings and certainly no cambered airfoils to generate lift. In my last video I talked about why it took humanity so long to achieve flight. Thrust is one of the reasons it took humanity so long to achieve flight. Before the advent of the internal combustion engine, sustainable flight was just a dream. Without a reliable thrust source, all we could do was glide for a small amount of time until we eventually succumbed to drag. This is the byproduct of an increased thrust, drag. Drag is caused by air resistance. So as you speed up, the air resistance also increases. Because of this problem, aerospace engineers have to carefully select the materials that they put on the outer surface of the aircraft. They have to select materials that have a low coefficient of friction to not exacerbate the problem. There are two main categories of drag, parasitic and induced drag. There are three types of parasitic drag, form drag, interference drag, and skin friction. All forms of parasitic drag 
work in the opposite direction of thrust. Or in other words, they oppose thrust. This type of drag is worsened when you increase your angle of attack. The reason that this increases drag is as you increase the angle of attack on the airplane, you're exposing more of the air to a greater area of the aircraft. In other words, the unfortunate side effect of trying to increase your lift by increasing the angle of attack, you're actually increasing the drag force, which requires you to exert even more thrust. The second type of drag is called induced drag. Unlike parasitic drag, induced drag works in the downward direction. The main type of induced drag is what's known as wingtip vortices. When I discussed the Bernoulli principle, I explained how there's a higher pressure below the surface of the wing and a lower pressure above the surface of the wing. Induced drag is caused by the slippage of the high pressure air on the low pressure side on the side of the wings. This will cause a swirling motion to push down on the wings and increase the weight of the aircraft. In other words, induced drag increases the effective weight of the aircraft. Weight is a constant struggle in aerospace engineering, just like it is for most of America. When you reduce the weight of an aircraft, you don't need to generate as much lift. And a lighter aircraft needs less thrust to maintain steady level flight. Recently, the aerospace manufacturing industry has started to adopt carbon fiber reinforced polymers as opposed to the traditional aluminum alloy used in most aircraft. Not only is it a lighter material, but it's also a stronger material. In order to compensate for its weight, an aircraft must be able to generate more lift than its weight. In order to design a successful aircraft, that aircraft must have the ability to overcome each of its opposing forces. Thrust must be greater than the force of drag in order to accelerate the aircraft to take off. The lift force must be greater than the weight force in order to lift off of the ground. But thrust must also be able to decrease below the force of drag in order to stop the airplane. And for that same reason, if you were never able to decrease the lift force, you would never land. In order to maintain what's known as steady level flight, thrust must equal drag and lift must equal weight. In my next video, I'm going to talk about how we use these principles to control the flight of an aircraft. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you want to see more content like this, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Thank you all for watching, and Godspeed.